I think we'll go ahead and get started here as people are streaming in. Buenos dias y bienvenidos. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am Evelyn Kasuga. I am the board chair for Arizona Town Hall. And thank you so much for joining us today. Arizona Town Hall is pleased to bring yet another uh, program of mutual interest to the Arizona Sonoran region. Uh, since 2017, we've jointly explored a number of topics, including economic and business development, the, the competitive binational region, tourism, sports, we've had a mayor's panel, we've had the consul general panel, and today we are talking about cross-border connecting, agriculture on the border. And by the way, this session it will be recorded, so it will be on our uh, YouTube site for future reference. Or if you have someone that, that couldn't make it today but wants to uh, join, please let, uh, know that that is available. And serving as your moderator, I am pleased to introduce my dear friend, Paul Brierly, who is the executive director of the Yuma Center of Excellence for Desert Agriculture. So Paul, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And thank All you right, to our Evelyn. speakers. All right. Yeah, thank you. We got some great speakers today and I'm proud to introduce them. Um, yeah, thrilled to do this, this um, webinar today. I, um, a little more about myself, I've been actually I was surprised when I did the math, I close to 30 years in Arizona agriculture. Um, I started in, in, I came from California, don't always admit that, but I uh, grew up on a small farm there and uh, started in production in Southeast Arizona and uh, moved to work for the Farm Bureau in Maricopa County. And now I'm in Yuma County uh, with the University of Arizona doing, uh, uh, running a research center to try to solve the problems of agriculture. So I've been, around the state and uh, and built up a lot of contacts. So surround yourself with people that know stuff and and uh, things work out well. Uh, a little bit about Arizona agriculture. It's really an amazing industry. Um, as you know, it feeds and clothes the world. Um, it adopts technology at, at a pretty staggering pace and that's accelerating, I believe. Um, uh, the Arizona people know it's a, it's, it's a big part of the five C's that we talk about in Arizona. Um, but it's still a very vibrant industry. It contributes over $23 billion to uh, Arizona's economy. Um, so being in Yuma these last seven and a half years, I've certainly seen firsthand um, cross-border agriculture. Uh, in fact, I wanted to show real quick, I don't have a slideshow, but I wanna share one image. And hopefully you can see that. Um, in our arid landscape, it's pretty obvious to tell where, where there's water and, and where the water is producing uh, food and crops. Um, I brought up this particular picture. Um, some of you will recognize it, some of you may not, but um, the green obviously is agriculture. And if you look at it, it looks pretty similar all through here. This is the border with Mexico and Arizona up through here and then the border with California and Mexico here. So my point being, if you didn't know those borders were there, this just looks like a big agricultural region producing much of the same crops, using the same water source, the Colorado River. Um, so I think it's really appropriate that we address binational agriculture. Um, so for the past hundred years or so, probably the biggest issues impacting agriculture have been uh, maximizing productivity and profitability, uh, international trade, water and labor. And, and as much as we work on them and, and things change, they also stay the same. Um, so when Linda asked me to put together a webinar to address cross-border agriculture, I thought probably the best way was to get a speaker on each of those areas and, and somebody that's you know, in, in those topic areas up to their eyeballs. And that's what we found, um, thrilled with the speakers that we got and, uh, and you're in for a real treat. So um, I've asked each of them to give us kind of a binational view of, of the challenges and the opportunities uh, in that particular topic area. And they'll go through for about 15 minutes each. And then, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. So uh, as you think of questions, please put them in the Q&A box or in the chat box. I can track them easier if they're in the Q&A box and we will get to those after everybody's had a turn to speak. 
So with that, we're, we're going to start with farming on both sides of the border. Um, and then we'll cover importing, exporting trade kind of topics. And then we will cover water and then we'll cover labor. Um, so to start with, on the production side, we have Randy Bach. He's the chief operations officer for JV Smith Companies and El Toro Agricola. Um, and I probably butchered that, but uh, um, they produce on both sides of the border on that map that I showed you. So uh, without further ado, Randy, why don't you go ahead? Well, hello everybody. Um, yes, I, my name is Randy Bach and I do work for both El Toro and JV Smith companies. We farm about 11,000 acres in uh, the Mexicali Valley, 65% of it is organic. And we farm 12,000 acres in Yuma Valley, going from Gila to Dome Tacna to the uh, Yuma Valley itself. Um, we have been farming in Mexico since 1982. We started in Sonora and then moved to the Cuervos area in 1995. There's a lot of as, you, as I said, we're balanced on, on our acres, but there's a lot of comparison that, and key points to be looked at about why we farm in both areas. First of all, uh, land rents. Land rents in Yuma are, did, I lose, did you lose me? I just blanked out. You blanked, but you're back. We heard you the whole time. Okay. Uh, land rents in Yuma run about $800 to $1,000 per acre. Uh, if you go out toward the east, which is where we start the season and end the season, the rents are about $500 to $650 an acre. In Mexico, depending on the quality of the ground, depending on how long you've been on it, it can be anywhere between $340 an acre to $560 an acre. So in, when looking at that, the east of Yuma is very close cost-wise to what Mexico is. Where the premium is, is in Yuma. And if you're in the Yuma Valley, or if you're over in the Gila Valley, you're gonna be in that 800 to $1,000 an acre um, cost. The big difference when it comes to land base is in when you go to Yuma, very rarely does a Yuma ranch come available. People don't give up ground in Yuma because the philosophy is if you lose it, you're never going to get it back. So even if your acres don't match your uh, inventory, you're going to find something to do with it so you have those acres for the next year. Now in Mexico, there's much, many, many, many more acres available. Uh, sometimes people who are farming their acres realize that they're not gonna make as much as they could if they rented it. And so they choose to rent it. Some people just feel that that's a constant income they want to keep. So we can find acres where it becomes difficult is making it organic. Because as I said, 65% of our, of our 11,000 acres is organic. And it takes three years for us to, to convert it uh, to organic if it's been conventional. Water in Mexico uh, and on Yuma are two different animals. The water in Yuma is really, really good compared to the water of Mexico. My, Mexico waters tends to be uh, higher in salt. Um, generally the water in Yuma is all river water through the irrigation districts, whether it be the water users, Mesa, Mohawk. Um, Mexico has river water which is fed, was considered federal water. We also have federal wells and private wells. Uh, in Mexico, the structure is a little bit different. First of all, Conagua controls everything at, at the federal level. And then we have five modulos in the Mexicali Valley that control the, the water in each one of their geographical areas. Each one has its own manager. Each one has its own boards. Each one has its own politics that go with it. And so we in Mexico have one individual where his whole job is handling water. 
and handling the um, permits and any issues that go with that. This person also is the person who does all of our um, land leases too and works with our, um, excuse me, with our landlords. One of the things that we're very careful of in Mexico, Mexico, a lot of the pieces are smaller. So we have a lot of different landlords and we try to put the property together in the largest group we can to avoid um, having conflict with landlords when we are trying to germ crops in, in the winter season. So you, it is not unusual to see us have two, three, four hundred acres all in one block. And as, as I said, we've been here since 1995. It's taken a while to get to that goal, but we do control the water, do control the uh, access to it. By also controlling the water, we minimize the chances of having a contamination um, from somebody else in the area. The, the difference that is in the water allotment between the US and Mexico is kind of interesting. The US has five acre foot allotted for irrigation. Uh, Mexico is 8.33 acre feet. That's this year. Now talking to people, what I'm told, and that's the latest and greatest news to me today, is Yuma's not going to have to maybe worry about having our allotment cut for 23, 24. Yet, Mexico is saying that we could have our, our allotment reduced this January, which is um, interesting because of the fact that we're in the middle of season. We'll see how that works out. But the water situation, the allotments, right now we have plenty. Now, if, if they were to cut our water in, um, in January, we would be able to purchase water from uh, other sources. So us not having the water is not a big issue. If we go over our five acre feet in Yuma, we can also, again, be charged for our excess water. Now, the next big thing in, in Mexico is labor. Labor is a problem for everybody. Surprise, it's also a problem in Mexico. Uh, everyone says, if we only can come bring people from Mexico, we can have plenty of labor. Well, we're having trouble with labor in Mexico as well. Mexico, in Mexico, El Toro, we year round employ 2,500 employees. During the high season, we go to 5,000 employees. Now, recently, and recently being the last two or three years, we have been bringing 10% of our employees from Puebla, from the south. We have recruiters down there year round so that we always have a presence. The U.S. is using domestic employees, and as everyone knows, but the use of H-2A is becoming much more common. And honestly, a lot of times the H-2A workers are more consistent about coming to work and uh, provide a, a better product. So you're seeing more and more people going to H-2A in the United States, but both the United States and Mexico are both struggling on labor. It's not like it used to be where you had more people than you needed. That's, uh, that's long gone. Five things that are the same between US and Mexico and cost. And this is always interesting when we're dealing with our customers, especially doing contracts. And right before this, I was in the middle of budgets looking at this next year's contracts. And five things that are very, are common costs, tractors, seed, chemicals, fertilizers. There is no difference between farming in Mexico and farming in the US when it comes to those, those items. Fuel can fluctuate. Gen generally, the fuel is, is, is close. Sometimes the United States will be higher, sometimes will be lower. Presently, Mexico is lower than, uh, than the United States, and that's why we're seeing such long lines 
uh, down in the border area with people going across to get fuel. And there was a panic just recently that uh, Mexico was going to run out of uh, gas in, in the border areas. Now, the downside of, of working between Mexico and US, number one is the border. Every, anyone who's ever worked here will tell you the border. Um, the biggest thing on moving product back and forth is testing. We get tested by the USDA depending on what port we go to. Most of the time, it's going to either be a residue test which means we're going to be held up for maybe a day or two, or a pest ID. The pest ID is generally an aphid, which they know it's an aphid, they can see it's an aphid, but they're going to do a pest ID, in which case we are going to be held um, until such time as the ID comes back. The other thing that is an issue at the border is mud, soil, and that's going both ways. You any type of any type of pest, any type of mud, you're going to be held up at the border. Crossing, everything has to be in, imported or exported. Now, all the trucks that we use are CTPAT certified. We are CTPAT certified. And that's done by the US government. And that allows the trucks to get into the line and basically go on the fast pass, fast on the fast lane. If we don't have that, we again have a delay delivering to the United States. And again, being able to have fluidity between the United States and Mexico always seems to be the greatest obstacle of doing business in both countries. The other thing that is a, an issue between anyone who's traveled to Mexico is recruitment of employees who want to come work in Mexico from the U US. And it's not because of Mexico, it's because of having to go home. Uh, when I first started in Mexico that long ago, there was no sentry. It was not unusual for me to get in line at seven o'clock in the morning. And if I was fortunate, I got home at nine. If it wasn't a good night, I got home at 10. And when you do that six, seven days a week, it makes a long week. So that's for recruitment of quality people to Mexico to work here. And that's probably one of the, the biggest obstacles we have. Holidays, whether it be bringing thing, product into Mexico or taking it out is an issue. Whether it's a US holiday or a Mexican holiday, it will impact the port. The port will close early and your hours of service are highly restrained. One of the things that we ran into this year is wages in Mexico. And the, they raised the wages in January. This last year, when we do our budgets in June, July with our customers, we budgeted 15%. They made it 21 in January. And so we were absorbing a 6% increase this last year that we really didn't get covered in budget. Another thing that is a big deal here is food safety in Mexico versus US. You have to go be twice as good in Mexico because of negative perceptions. If you look in the United States, drive around, you'll see around the fields, a little small two foot fences that are temporary. Ours are four foot fences with uh, chicken, uh, chicken mesh and they're permanent with gates to keep the, uh, any animals out. In the United States, they do N equals 60 for sampling, means 60 samples in five acres. We do 60 samples in one acre. So when we do five acres where you're in the United States, they're doing 60 samples, we're doing 300 to make sure that we have clear product going to the United States. Um, the domestic labor is tightening greatly, as I said. Last year, we lost 120 people to H2A because we are so close to the border. All the labor contractors from the United States are using us as our training facility. Um, that's not voluntary, by the way, on our part. And they come and they 
are taking our crews over across to be used uh, for labor. And that is impacting us as well. One of the things that's a misconception that everything in Mexico can be grown cheaper. And that's not the case. One of the products that we've been growing lately um, in the last two or three years is iceberg. We never, never grew a iceberg in all the other years I was in this business. And we told everyone when they came in, iceberg's not gonna do well because of the salts in, in Mexico. Our, our soil is saltier, our water is saltier. Well, it's true. In the United States, you will produce 38,000 pounds by acre uh, with iceberg. Mexico, we're 32,000. The cost is the same or higher. So one of the things that we're looking at doing is not growing iceberg again in, in Mexico because it's not profitable for both of our companies. It's better to come out of Mexico with that. And if they're going to use it in Mexico at the processing plants, bring it from Mexico. I'm bringing it from Yuma. Celery, bunching items, broccolette, uh, Brussels sprouts, green onions, all the labor intensive things are beneficial to come out of Mexico. I'm trying to watch my time, make sure I don't run over to that on. I'm at 15 minutes. Um, what I would encourage everybody to do, if, if you would please, to get more information about Agricola Al Toro. If you are a member of Facebook, please pull that up. You'll see some of the wonderful things we do in Mexico. A lot of the things you will see does not happen in the United States. Um, due to the fact that we are so heavily involved with our community here with the different ajitos. And uh, any questions you have while looking at the Facebook page, please feel free to reach out and, to us and we'll answer them for you. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks Randy. That was, those are some interesting points even I hadn't thought of before. Um, and by the way, when, when Randy talks about a one to two day delay at the border, some people might think, well, it's the big deal. These are fresh produce crops for the most part, I'm assuming. And uh, a one to two hour delay is a problem. The shelf life and the cooling requirements, a one to two days can, I assume, can ruin your product. Well, without a doubt. And also, you know, as, as part of the, not only are they checking now for um, bugs and, and contaminants, and then you also have the obligatory uh, screening for uh, x-ray and also for drug testing. Wow. Well, Randy, thanks again. Please stick around. We'll, we'll have questions at the end. Um, I wanna move now to somebody who's dealt with the border for a long time and, uh, and these kinds of issues. Jaime Chamberlain is with us. He's, he's been in the industry for 35 years. Um, he owns and is president of Chamberlain Distributing, an importer of Mexican fruits and vegetables um, that's been around for 50 years. He's also uh, on the executive board of the Arizona Mexico Commission, uh, chairman of the Greater Nogales Santa Cruz County Port Authority, and uh, and a whole bunch of other things. But those are probably the most relevant to today's discussion. So Jaime, thanks for joining us. I, I know that you, uh, again, you deal a lot with the border and, and imports and trades. And so we'd love to hear about challenges and opportunities from your sector. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you, Arizona Town Hall, for making this possible and the University of Arizona um, uh, Agriculture School. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone here today uh, from Nogales, Arizona. Uh, welcome. Uh, Randy, thank you for your, for your talk there. And um, I, I had the privilege of meeting Vic Smith many, many years ago, and he's invited me to go see your farm both in Yuma and also in, uh, on the Mexican side as well, a few different times. So one of these days I'm gonna get out there. I just seem to be too busy in Nogales. <laughs> but, anytime, uh, anytime. <laughs> thank you very Rand, much. Randy's in Mexico today, by the way. I don't think he, I don't think he yeah. mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, the, the Smith Company is a, is a leader in, in, in the ag business in that area and wet items and they have been for a long, long time. Um, so uh, let me just a little bit of background about myself. I'm I'm in Chamberlain. I am president of Chamberlain Distributing. Uh, my mother and my father started our business in 1971 together um, as uh, 
representatives of, of Mexican farmers and Mexican fruits and vegetables. I came into the business in 1987 full time uh, to work with them. And now I own the business together with my sister, Diana. And um, we represent uh, 13 different farmers in Mexico, of which the majority of them, we've been working with them since my parents were heading up the organization. Um, we are working uh, with farmers now that are on their second and third generations uh, of, um, of family ownership, which is a, a great privilege for both my sister and I to be working with our second generation partners. Um, you know, a lot of times you have different owners come into the distributorships and, and sometimes the farmers uh, don't stick around. We're very, very fortunate to have had uh, great relationships with our farmers. We started with a lot of them with uh, five hectares, 10 acre hectares, 20 hectares of product. And some of them are now, uh, um, we've got one big squash grower that grows about 800 hectares of squash, just one of them. And we have three in Mexico. So um, we're very, very pleased with their growth. And obviously with our growth here in the United States, um, I was telling Brian, uh, Paul a little earlier that, you know, uh, with I wear many different hats other than taking care of our growers on a daily basis and the marketing of our products throughout North America, of which we're very, very proud to, to uh, here in Nogales uh, to be importing now for a, a little over 100, about 115, 120 years through Nogales, uh, our products from Mexico throughout, the, throughout North America. Uh, it, it, it's a great privilege for us in, in Nogales to have a port of entry as large as Nogales is and as important as it is to American agriculture. Uh, a lot of people ask me, what do you do? And what does a distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables do in simple terms? And when you say it really quietly, it's, it's really, really important. Uh, and we, we feed North America and um, we help feed North America with a lot of farmers in Mexico, with farmers in the US and with farmers in Canada. And um, that's something that we take very, very seriously and we take it to heart. You know, in our little town, there's only 22,000 people here, but you know, these 22,000 people here are, are crossing about $5 billion worth of ag business in, in value um, on a yearly basis. That, that's tremendous. And if you consider about another $25 billion worth of manufactured goods, uh, you can see our little community is really humming uh, all the time, 365 days a year. So, um, you know, I, I agree with a lot of the things that Randy was saying about uh, domestic agriculture and Mexican agriculture. Randy said a few things there that with uh, Mexican agriculture, there are very few differences as far as the costs are. Um, the labor cost, uh, water cost, seed costs, a lot of those costs are very, are, those fixed costs are very similar to domestic um, products, to domestic farms. Um, so we have our great challenges, but as we have our challenges together, and I was telling Paul, I really believe that we're in a very, very special time for agriculture. And I, I, can't, I can't tell you all how proud I am um, at my 54 years of age. I think I'm just barely getting to understand a little bit about our business. And I can tell you that it is a fantastic industry in which I see so many young people being interested now. Um, during COVID, a lot of children were staying indoors and not going to school and had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about food. And I think that that trend has been going on now for about the last 10 years. You know, when I was eight or nine years old, I was not thinking about where my food came from, nor was I thinking about cooking. And now you talk to eight year olds and nine year olds and 10 year olds and they're interested in cooking and they're interested in finding out what ways, where their food is coming from and, um, and in what ways they can use and incorporate their food and their, and their daily diets. So it's in a really exciting time for me as a, as a marketer of, of Mexican fruits and vegetables. Um, I, I remember clearly when I was a kid that um, 
I would walk into a store and I'd ask my mom for tangerines or peaches or strawberries. And she would say, well, they're out of season. Well, now I, I think all of us can relate um, with young kids now when they walk into a store, they do not have that issue. You know, everything is, is available 365 days a year, whenever you want, however you want it in different pack styles and different in different weight measurements. I mean, you can find everything anywhere you want at every store you go into now. So kids don't have that curiosity uh, like we used to and to say when things are out of season. Well, there's a reason why they're not out of season. It's because of the United States grade trade agreements that they fostered not only with Mexico, but with Canada, um, European countries and Asian countries alike, also the Central and Caribbean countries as well. Um, so that's why I think it's, it's such an exciting time to be in our industry. Um, I talk a lot about not only what we do here at Chamberlain Distributing on a daily basis, but what our responsibilities are as ambassadors of, of food products all over the United States. Everyone says, I mean, how do you find the time to do the other things that you do? Uh, in my responsibility with the Arizona Mexico Commission, um, and as well as my responsibility with the Greater Nogales Santa Cruz County Port Authority, I look forward to working with our federal partners and our state partners um, and our, uh, our state representatives and even our local uh, representatives, political representatives, in working with them to figure out ways of how to get our products across into the United States in a more efficient and, and quicker manner. That means working on infrastructure issues, whether it's, we just finished uh, the State Route 130, uh, State Route uh, 189, which was a $135 million project that, that was a reconfiguration and a remodeling of four miles of, of road that uh, comes from the Mariposa Port of Entry um, to I-19 and onto Grand Avenue, which is our main street in Nogales, which is also a state route. So working with our federal partners and our state partners, we got that reconfiguration done. And the reason we did it is so that our port of entry, we have the ability to have the throughput that we see not only now and, and the safety core and, and, and to have that safety corridor that we have with the trucks that we're crossing now, along with the, the regular traffic um, and that we have around this corridor, but with the possibilities of increasing our Mexican fruits and vegetables business uh, to the United States. Um, Randy said something a little bit a little while ago. He said he was looking at budgets depending on contracts. I think he was talking about his land contracts. But I look at my contracts that I have with our retailers, whether it's Walmart or Costco or Aldi's or Safeway or Kroger. And we're consistently looking at that and saying, and looking at how much, how much time can we, for how much time can we offer our products? And what we've seen is that the consistency out of Mexico with the availability, the consistent availability of products and the quality that we've come up with, um, is, is something that's extremely attractive, not only to our retailer partners, but to our food service partners and to our wholesalers all across North America. So I think that um, we, we not only on our day-to-day -day businesses, we also have a, that responsibility to look beyond our businesses and say, well, how else can we make our, our um, distribution and our, and our food industry more effective and more efficient? In Nogales, we're consistently looking at non-intrusive non inspection uh, equipment at our ports of entry. And uh, we're always um, at the forefront of pilot programs with different types of technology. Um, we're always looking at whether our staffing is, is at the correct levels that it should be. I have to tell you that uh, in Nogales and the Tucson sector of CBP, during the pandemic, um, they were absolutely fantastic 
in their in their in the way that they handled the pandemic. Uh, there were times where our local CBP was down 40 or 50 different agents at, at the ports of entry, and they never slowed down commercial crossings. Obviously, because of non-essential workers, there were less people coming in by cars and less people walking across the border, but they never shut down the commercial port of entry. In fact, we in, the, in 2021, we increased the amount of trucks that we came in with uh, from Mexico into the United States, and we set a record. We said over 385,000 trucks came in from Mexico, and we figure that about a million trucks come into the state of Arizona to pick up our fruits and vegetables, whether it's here or whether it's in Douglas or whether it's in Yuma and San Luis. We are very, very fortunate that we have a port of entry, that we have the ports of entry that we have. And we're very, very fortunate that we have our federal partners uh, with CBP who understand us. It took us a while, but we convinced CBP, at least in the Tucson sector, that we were the clients of the border. We were the clients of the ports and that we made them understand that the more efficient they were and the more effective they were, that that was the basis of our economic security. And in Nogales, we are always talking about our economic security and our viability because we're in a very, very competitive business. Um, there are states like Texas and California that are consistently trying to take our crossings away from, uh, from Nogales and from San Luis and, and from Douglas as well. And we're consistently working toward bringing more and more products through our ports of entry that had never typically been through here. So just recently, we've seen a great uptick in the berry business. In fact, berries are the number one com growth commodity for Mexican agriculture to be exported to the United States and Canada. Just the last five years has been an absolute explosion as well as avocados. Now those products typically don't come through our ports of entry. They typically go through Texas. And just recently we've seen quite a bit uptick of those products coming in through here along with a lot of tropical items like papayas and, and, and mangoes. So I, I think, um, I, I look at our business, Paul, and, and everybody here uh, on, the, on the webinar, and I, I feel I'm really, really blessed because I'm in, I think, even though I've been in the business 35 years, I think it, I may, or I'm right smack in the middle of my career. That's the way I look at it. And to be in this position at, at this moment with a, so many positive things looking toward our way, um, especially here in Arizona, I, I, I feel very blessed and I feel that, you know, we are on the verge uh, of, um, of really another explosion or a continuation of our explosion. I know that for 2022, we are well on our way to breaking another record uh, of crossing Mexican fruits and vegetables into the United States. And we're very happy to do it. And as you can see the changing climates uh, in Canada, uh, you see the changing climates, uh, uh, agricultural climates in, in domestic uh, areas where like Florida and Georgia and Texas and, and in, in, the, in the Michigan area. As you see those different climates, we are seeing different climates as well in Mexico, but we are taking great advantage of that in, uh, with through technology and through better seed breeding and specific seed breeding for our areas that we that we have um, that we work in. So I, I look forward to any questions from anyone in the audience. And you know, I could go on forever, but talking about our industry because I think we're just so lucky. Um, I, I, lots of times I say we're recession proof. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not, uh, this year, I'm not so sure we're recession proof or pandemic proof because it's been a, a tough couple of years, but uh, we're getting through it. And at the end of the day, uh, as I started out my talk, you know, we're doing a, a, a tremendous, tremendous job with all of our farmer partners um, in feeding North America. So Paul, thank you.
Thank you. I mean, that's great. I, you know, like you, and I'm just a few years older than you, but uh, I looked at when I was younger and looked at my parents that were this age, I thought they were just coasting, but I don't feel like I'm coasting. I feel like I'm really in the middle of things and, and being able to make things happen. And I, I, I thought about leaving agriculture, getting more involved with just public policy in general at one point. And I realized Agriculture is at the nexus of so many things, whether it's water and climate change, obviously the important things like food production, but, but uh, taxes, immigration, border issues, it's, it, it all runs through agriculture. So I uh, appreciate your comments on that. Yeah, I knew what I wanted to do when I was about eight years old. My dream was to go to Notre Dame to learn how to sell tomatoes. I never got to Notre Dame, but I sure sold a whole lot of tomatoes. <laughs> so uh, I always knew what I wanted to do and I was pretty focused and I, I've never been more more happy uh, to work in it in, than I am now in this industry. Well, you sure you sure made an impact, and I know I love tomatoes. I sure appreciate having them year round. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, we have one question that we'll save for the end uh, from from Eva. But uh, everybody, please type your questions in as we go, as you think of them, so you don't forget them, and we'll address them uh, after everyone's spoken. So. Um, now we want to move on to water, a, a little issue with uh, not just agriculture, but, but all of us really, and uh, certainly a shared resource. Um, so we have brought one of the best, Wade Noble. He's, uh, he's an attorney with Noble Law Office. He's also the general counsel for irrigation districts around the Yuma area. Um, and he's the coordinator of the Yuma County Agricultural Water Coalition, uh, which among other things has, has uh, sponsored some research that, that uh, the University of Arizona is doing to uh, understand better scientifically um, how water is being used and, and, and uh, how it can be most efficiently done. So uh, um, Wade, I think with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, could you throw back up that satellite photo you had of the area for just a couple of seconds? I will do While that. I say some things about myself. Um, I've been living and working in the Yuma area for over 40 years, have been representing irrigation districts for over 30 years, uh, have been involved in a number of issues on the Colorado River and in the state of Arizona with regards to water. Uh, Randy and Jaime, you guys uh, kicked it off really well. Uh, this is a really good panel to be on and I appreciate the opportunity um, I hope now that the third leg of the relay, I get the baton and perhaps we can talk about some of those issues that are kind of critical to us. As you're looking at that satellite photograph, and thank you, Paul, you'll notice that uh, it's hard to see the boundaries. And one of the things I have to talk about is the shared resource of the Colorado River, but the sharing of it is also sharing the current conditions on the river, which include extreme drought that has been with us for over 20 years. Uh, as you see the satellite photograph, you'll notice that there's a little strip that runs down in through the area that we recognize as the Colorado River. And that is the shared resource for agriculture from the top of the river to the bottom of the river. As Randy alluded to somewhat, um, the water gets a little bit saltier as it comes downstream. Years ago, they blamed Welt Mohawk for that, and we continue to blame Colorado for that because of what they put into it. So thank you, Paul, for sharing that. Put me back up on the screen and I'll give the rest of my presentation. At any rate, drought does not recognize state borders or international boundaries. It just goes where it's going to be. And if you have a river system that starts in the northern part and flows to the south, if you don't get the precipitation in the upper regions of the basin, then you're going to have shortage throughout the basin. And that's what's happened in the drought. Let me give a brief history on the sharing of the water of the Colorado River. In 1922, after months of negotiations, the seven basin states of the Colorado River entered into a compact. That compact did not include any water for Mexico. 
it's not that they didn't realize that Mexico wasn't going to need or wasn't going to use water. It's just that they didn't have a treaty with Mexico at that time. They determined after careful calculation that the Colorado River generated about 15 million acre feet of water per year. And so they allocated that. By 1944, Mexico had um, also shown its strength in saying, listen, we're gonna have to have a treaty that allows us to have water from the Colorado River. And so in 1944, the two governments signed a treaty called the Mexico Water Treaty of 1944 surprising name in which it's actually a much longer name, but I'm not going to repeat it, in which they gave, I'm sorry, in which uh, Mexico received 1.5 million acre feet of Colorado River water each year. We were able to distribute that over the years, even though that created a stress on the system because we found that the river was not generating the 16.5 million acre feet that we had allocated out of the river. And then, as I previously said, in 2002, we started experiencing drought. I guess it was 2001 drought. And that drought has continued without much relief up until today. The the idea that drought might severely hamper the ability to deliver water was not un, unchallenged. And so we got together in 2007 and drafted shortage criteria guidelines and developed tier shortages. A tier one shortage would, shortage would occur when the level of Lake Mead was predicted to be at 1,075 feet above sea level. That happened last year. And so we are now in a tier one shortage in 2022. It is expected that we will shortly be in a tier two A shortage, elevation 1050, and perhaps even a tier two B shortage at elevation 1045 very quickly. Uh, from what Randy had to say, it sounds like in Mexico, they're predicting that that shortage will come and they're going to cut agriculture water as a result of that. That's just one of the impacts that shortages have uh, on agriculture or upon the use of Colorado River water. Now, other impacts are in the lower basin. Uh, in order to get the Central Arizona project built, Arizona had to agree that in the event of a shortage, uh, they would take the cut uh, in their allocation. And by that, we mean they would take the cut for uh, the Central Arizona project users. In the upper basin, they have a different approach to it, but each of the basins receives 7.5 million acre feet annually except that over a 10, every 10 year period, the upper basin had to deliver 75 million acre feet. Internationally, as we have said, there's 1.5 million acre feet that is allocated to Mexico. So as we plan for drought, Arizona out of its 2.8 million acre feet of allocation was required to take the cuts as they came or take the biggest cuts as they came and plans were made and hundreds of thousands of acre feet were conserved and hundreds of thousands of acre, acre feet were cut uh, with the uh, tier one shortage that was declared for this current year. In that sharing of the river under the treaty obligations, Mexico did not end up with a requirement to share uh, under the treaty as the as time evolved under the amendments to the treaty known as minutes uh, minute 319 323 other minutes allowed for there to be some cuts or conservations in mexico uh, to leave water in lake mead the problem is that if you don't keep water in the reservoirs 
pretty soon you can't operate the reservoirs. And we're now looking at with a possibility of a tier 2B shortage at elevation 1045 uh, in Lake Mead, uh, coupled with a severe reduction in the inflows into Lake Powell, uh, you're looking at the possibility that you can't operate uh, Lake Powell because of the uh, structures and facilities that are there. And also, in part, you're looking at the inability to generate electricity through the hydropower generators that are in Lake Powell through Glen Canyon Dam. At any rate, moving into uh, the impacts of it, as alluded to by Randy, agriculture in Mexico that uses Colorado River water is being told that there could be some cuts as early as January of this coming year. That's not the same for agriculture on the Colorado River above the international boundary. The priorities uh, that were developed for the use of water in uh, Arizona are that uh, those who are using water at the time of the compact have first priority. Those who have contracts before the CAP contract are, have a third and second priority, which are equal. And the proposal is that there will be no cuts in those until such time as the uh, drought continues to worsen. That doesn't mean that we're not planning for it, but it does mean that it impact will eventually come. Uh, but it is not here yet. I guess we should easily say that the greatest concern is if the water in the river continues to drop, at some point, the Secretary of Interior will make a decision regardless of priorities, and that could be devastating for agriculture. On the plus side, let's talk a little bit about the shared resource opportunities that uh, come to us because of the Colorado River. Uh, agriculture, again, based on perhaps three or four very significant uh, factors in the Yuma area and in the uh, area south of the border is highly productive. And by that we mean when uh, Jaime says we're bringing uh, food across that feeds North America, in the Yuma and San Luis areas, Mexicali areas, during the winter season, uh, we provide 80 to 90% of the, what we call the winter produce for over 300 million people. That's a significant input to our food supply for North America. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that's being challenged by uh, those who claim that agriculture uses too much water, I'll get a little bit more to that, but we're highly efficient in doing that. Uh, sometimes, uh, whether it's on in Mexico or in the United States, people look at it and say, well, they use all this water and let's figure out some way to make it more efficient. Uh, let's use more drip. Let's do more of this. Let's do more of that. Uh, I think that Randy would probably agree with me. Water is necessary to grow crops. And you certainly don't want to use any more water than is necessary. The idea is not to just throw water mindlessly on the crops because too much water is as deadly to a crop as too little water. And therefore you'll find that the technology that is used in our area, whether it's United States or Mexico, is some of the best in the world we lead the world in being able to produce food from our area. We're often challenged in saying, well, wait a minute, you use 70% of the water and obviously that's not fair, it's unjust. As we study the use of water in agriculture around the world, we find that in arid and semi-arid lands, Yuma and Mexico, in this area, I think Jaime would agree with it as well. 
we are in arid and semi-arid lands. In those lands around the world, 70% of the water supply is dedicated to food production. That's just the way it is. You're going to have to be able to have food from those areas and in those areas, and it's going to take about that much water. The difference for us is that in the Yuma and Mexico sectors that we're talking about using this shared supply, we grow about five times more than anybody else in the world. So why would you start saying, well, that's just too much. Uh, we've got to cut some of that water. You've got to use it better. Now, we agree. If there are good ideas at using water more efficiently, we want to employ those. And it's not that someone's going to come along and say, boy, I just discovered this. And this is a huge uh, way of changing the way you do business. And it's changing the way you farm. Frankly, if we don't jump up and down and say, oh, yeah, it's because we've tried most of those ways of doing it on both sides of the border. We know what it takes to grow crops well. We do a great job of growing those crops using the water that's available to us. We hear a lot about perhaps drip or the current one is end drip. Um, I'm not sure how well that's going to help with the water supply. For the most part, as we have tested it and looked at it, and as we've talked to the people who are bringing it to us from Israel, they finally end up saying, well, in your area, it may not result in a significant change in the use of water. Other uh, concerns that I've seen as far as challenges are concerned using this resource is some People say, well, wait a minute, all you're doing is bolstering agribusiness in competition with other businesses. And frankly, that's uninformed. And the reason is agribusiness is not just any other business. In agribusiness, we are, we are producing the food that is eaten. Food does not come from the grocery store, it comes from agriculture. So we need to protect our water supply used for food production. We need to respond to drought. We need to conserve water where it can be conserved. We need to make sure that all alternatives are explored on both sides of the border, but they are already. Uh, and when cuts come, we need to make sure that we cut Shall I say, Randy, and I hope you don't mind this, shall we cut fringe agriculture? Uh, some portions of agriculture we probably aren't as productive or as highly valuable as others. And when I say that, I think of alfalfa. Ah, oh, you can't grow alfalfa in the desert. Well, I just don't see tons of alfalfa sitting out uh, on the side of the road that hasn't been consumed. So. I think that alfalfa itself is part of the supply chain. You got to have it. My final point is this. As we set water policy, as we decide who's going to get the water, I think we need to remember that food shortages must not result from water policy. Thank you for the opportunity. Excellent, Wade. Thank you. Appreciate those perspectives. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have questions at the end. So let's get to our last main issue that uh, has been around agriculture forever. And, and uh, the crops that you see behind John Bolts there, the type of crops that take a lot of labor. They, they do take a lot of labor. Um, and so that's always been one of the, the challenges over time. Uh, so we have John Bolts here to, to talk with us about that. Um, we appreciate John coming. Uh, those of you that registered and saw it was going to be Chelsea McGuire from the Arizona Farm Bureau. She had a, a something she couldn't avoid. And I don't want to say John is the, the backup. And she she said herself that uh, John has elevated the, the discussion here. So, <laughs> so thanks for joining. John is a partner in Desert Premium Farms. And he's also the first vice president of the Arizona Farm Bureau. Um, so John, with that, please take it away. Well, thanks for the opportunity. It's it's certainly my privilege to get to address all of you today and look forward to answering your questions because I'm sure they will be 
uh, much more on point than my than my comments. And no, I <clears throat> I appreciate you bringing up Chelsea's comments, Paul, but I disagree. Uh, Chelsea uh, Chelsea would be outstanding, and I, I apologize on her behalf for not being here. Um, you'll have to settle for me. And uh, I am batting cleanup to continue with the uh, the baseball analogies laid out before me. So I'll do my best to get us home, uh, so to speak. So I think we've talked a lot about uh, climate and water uh, thus far. Those are two of the three big pillars that make uh, Arizona agriculture what it is. Uh, the third essential pillar, um, one might think it's soil, one might think it's lots of things, but it's ac actually agricultural workers. And um, so in Arizona as a whole, we have uh, give or take normally upwards of 100,000 agricultural work workers. Uh, making everything happen out uh, across our uh, our state, uh, the vast majority of whom are working in southern Arizona, but uh, we do have agriculture in every corner of the state, uh, top to bottom, east to west. So uh, animal agriculture is huge in Arizona. It's one of our leading sectors, uh, and it is the most expansive. It covers uh, nearly three fourths of our uh, of our state's uh, land mass uh, is producing. Uh, uh, agricultural products that are of an animal origin, whether they be uh, beef, cattle, sheep, or uh, or dairy. So uh, that's a that's a big contributor, and um, and I think you know if we step back and look, um, I think many of the things we discussed so far in this uh, uh, by other panelists, and I'll be no different here, is uh, touching on public policy. Uh, we're we're in a unique position. Um, we're one state out of 50, uh, we're a border state, and we have some unique uh, challenges and opportunities as the, uh, as the title of this program uh, addresses. Um, one of the greatest challenges, and it has been for a long, long time, is our, uh, our immigration uh, policy and our workforce policy. And so I'll touch on that as I go, but let me, let me throw a few numbers at you so you can have a better sense of Arizona agriculture a very conservative estimate that was put forward a couple of years ago from some economists at the University of Arizona, uh, calculated Arizona agriculture at $23.3 billion industry. Uh, that would be including net and induced impacts. And I say very conservative because uh, we have an ongoing raging debate about, um, about how they tallied some of the stuff for uh, the more productive segments, uh, namely Yuma County. Uh, agriculture. I think they did a decent job, but it's just very difficult to capture. Uh, the main reason being is the vast majority of studies, that study and studies like it, uh, take into account USDA statistics. Uh, and there's a large portion of uh, uh, the very productive parts of Arizona agriculture and California agriculture that are missed in those USDA statistics. So I know they are, they struggle and work to improve those every year. Uh, but that is what it is. Um, Arizona is uh, second in the nation at producing head lettuce that was mentioned before, uh, also second in leaf lettuce, romaine lettuce, cauliflower, broccoli, spinach, and cantaloupe. Um, there would be a number of products that we would be second on, um, but not for not having the, the labor supply to be able to produce them affordably. So a number of crops that we used to be second in uh, have faded away over the last uh, 30 years. Um, you know, asparagus uh, is, a, is a, a good one that comes to mind, not a huge acreage uh, of crop, but uh, it's faded away from Arizona and it's nearly faded away from California. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit later about public policy and efforts agriculture has made to improve that situation. So uh, uh, nationally within the United States, uh, Arizona produces also enough beef to feed uh, about 5 uh, million people uh, their annual consumption of beef. Um, so uh, holding our own. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, the population of Arizona, Arizona is a unique arid landscape, but we are able to produce a lot of the things uh, commensurate or well beyond uh, the, the population of our state. So beef is one of those things that we're, we're holding our own. Uh, interestingly, Wade talked about water quite a bit, and we do um, put to beneficial use a large quantity of water in Arizona agriculture um, all across the state. Uh, about uh, 7 um, million acre feet is used in Arizona 
uh, for one use or another. Um, and, uh, and we use about 2.8 million acre feet of Colorado River water near our allocation and nearly exactly what we contribute to the river basin. So as we talk about the use of it growing lettuce and growing these other crops on the lower river, um, we're, in a, we're in a unique position where we're about the only state that either isn't a much greater contributor like the upper basin states are, they contribute far more than they withdraw. Uh, out of the southern basin states, we, uh, we contribute about to the river what we take out of it. Um, so again, uh, with our production numbers across the, across uh, comparing us to other states in the nation, um, we're ranked second in, uh, in lemon and tangerine production. Um, and we, uh, a lesser known crop and not one that hits the big statistic numbers, but we are the, uh, the largest producer of dates. Um, the Yuma region is the largest producer of dates in the, uh, in the United States, and we ship more dates than anywhere else uh, in the world, as a matter of fact. Um, oddly enough, though, only uh, a small percentage of those dates are consumed here domestically. It's one of the few things that we ship overseas, um, aside of throwing cash into those empty storage uh, 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 cargo containers. Uh, we do send some dates and some forage products and other things uh, into those storage containers to head them uh, overseas. Uh, another thing that we produce a lot of that's a very labor intensive, and we'll get to more of the labor side of things here in just a minute, but just talk briefly about crops, is uh, we produce a lot of seed crops. The Yuma region um, is producing uh, seed crops that many of which can't be produced anywhere else in the world. Uh, we have a unique climate uh, being so dry, less than three inches average annual rainfall, and the ability to not only grow those crops to fruition, but then also harvest them in a dry climate is uh, second to none for production of many high value crops that are uh, sought for the world over. Uh, and Yuma is a, a key producer of that. Um, dairy is also a huge production issue in our, in our state. We, uh, that's one of the leading uh, production areas for Arizona agriculture. Uh, many years, it is the leading uh, uh, number one item of production, and we're not going to do it without alfalfa and without the hands to tend uh, to the cows and, and care for the production thereof. Um, I don't know the Arizona number. I wished I did specifically, but I do know nationally, uh, to the point about labor, nationally, uh, dairy, folks in the dairy industry uh, believe that they're about 100,000 workers short. Um, so doesn't necessarily matter where the workers come from, that's how short they are on a national basis. So Arizona being such a large dairy state, I'm sure that we would be a large percentage of that. And uh, lastly, I'll, I'll just point out that Arizona agriculture is pretty unique. We're one of those places where we could be planting uh, one crop and harvesting another just about any month out of the year. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty unique thing. You don't see that very many places. Um, I do know that some regions in Mexico are similar to that. Um, so Arizona and our, and our, uh, and our climate and, uh, and water situation. And then of course, uh, the contribution of agricultural workers is, uh, is second to none. So I mentioned earlier about 100,000 workers uh, plus working in Arizona agriculture. Upwards of 45,000 of those folks are working here in Yuma County. Um, anywhere from 15 to 20,000 of, uh, of those agricultural workers working in Yuma County uh, cross an international boundary uh, in the morning and return home in the evening. Um, that uh, their contribution to our, to our workforce is, uh, is exceptional, but it hasn't been enough to, uh, to completely fill our uh, labor needs in Yuma County agriculture or across the state. So Arizona, uh, even though we're a border state and I get asked frequently by folks when they come down from uh, folks like PBS and Fox News and uh, NBC News that have all interviewed me about the border crisis situation that we're dealing with uh, at present, our, our situation where our, our, our region across the southern border, which I think all of us that inhabit would like to have both on the Mexico and the Arizona side and the California side, of that international boundary would love to see it be an area of, uh, of legal commerce and of, uh, of uh, order and, uh, and prosperity for everybody. 
Um, it's been a difficult time uh, lately. Um, and, uh, and many folks think that, well, uh, labor shortage problems will be solved by folks uh, crossing the border uh, and, and surrendering and, and asking for asylum or asking for a work visa. That's just simply not the case. Uh, those folks are interested in getting as far north and as far away from the border as they possibly can. Many times they have family members in metropolitan areas across the US um, and that's where they seek to, uh, to find refuge and set up a new life. Um, but it's, it's a challenge that we, that we face and uh, are about our only avenue that we've been left with uh, in spite of those of us who have been going to uh, Congress and reminding them of their dereliction of, of uh, addressing this matter since 1986. Um, I, was, I was a young man and well, I wasn't even a man in 1986, I was eight years old. So, um, but my entire adult life, I've been um, heading back to uh, Washington DC and advocating for Arizona agriculture and American agriculture, uh, hoping that our policymakers would provide us with a, a guest work program that was beneficial to both worker and uh, an employer and met with um, what the industry needed and, uh, and could provide uh, an opportunity for workers to prosper and businesses to prosper. But um, Arizona agriculture is sadly held back. Uh, um, by all estimates, uh, a conservative estimate would be 50% growth. Um, I think a more realistic number would be nearly 100% growth of expansion uh, to our Arizona agriculture productivity um, if, we, uh, if we had adequate uh, worker supply. Um, many of the folks that come to work now are participating in the H-2A program. A couple of years ago, the most recent numbers that I have was nearly 8,000 workers uh, living in, in Yuma County, working, uh, participating in the H-2A temporary guest worker program. Uh, there are many flaws to that. That's a whole other seminar to, to cover, but I'll just say that um, uh, the Ritz-Carlton in New York City couldn't qualify for housing for the H-2A program. Um, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's a remarkable thing that we have the domestic uh, production of agricultural goods that we do. Oddly, uh, Mexico is a huge beneficiary of that. Many seed crops that are uh, grown in Mexico are produced and marketed out of, out of the Yuma area. Um, so everybody has a stake in seeing American agriculture be more productive, uh, certainly Americans do. Uh, I will leave it there uh, for, folks to offer up questions and address things. Uh, hopefully I've given you an overview that provokes some, some questions and some thoughts about uh, uh, agricultural workers and agriculture in general in Arizona. Thank you for your time and, and thank you for inviting me, Paul, even if I was your second thought for talking about agricultural workers. Thank you, John. I, I actually try not to ask John because John is is very busy advocating for agriculture and uh, if, if I can find an alternative, I do, because I know John always says yes. So I appreciate that. Um, so let's jump into questions. We, we have some, and I'll, I'll work on those, and please keep typing them into the, uh, the Q&A. Um, let's start with one that asked about um, value-added food processing, value-added agriculture, and, and the question specifically asked about Mexico, but I would ask it too for Arizona. I mean, it, it's one thing to grow crops that are a commodity, and, and you don't have much say over the price versus, uh, versus um, adding value to them and, and selling them as a, you know, for instance, selling, instead of selling tomatoes, selling some fancy um, salsa product. Um, so I wonder if, if anybody has comments on that, like I say, both on the Mexico side and the Arizona side, just uh, for this binational region, what, what role, how, how prevalent is value added agriculture and, and what, opportunities are there in that? Uh, Paul, I'll jump in. I'll just say that we have here in the Yuma region, we have uh, upwards of eight processing facility uh, on the Arizona side. Um, and that's mostly to service the roughly 50 million people that live within a drive of our region. Um, uh, the reality is, is that um, product is being produced um, uh, all over this region, both sides of the border and uh, down in central Mexico to ship to uh, processing facilities because the closer products are processed to the consumer is, uh, is key for freshness with these fresh 
uh, products that we've talked about uh, so prolifically in these discussions. Um, but that's that's just touching on fresh vegetables. I mean, go ahead. Yeah, I you know you first started seeing processors down in in Mexico right around 15 years ago, 15 18 years ago, and I, I think the 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 purpose of those processing facilities was obviously to grow products uh, and a lot of the winter items that you all do in Yuma and the wet items. Um, so the Querétaro area and the Guanajuato area was 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 found to be a, a, a very good area for the same types of items that you that you grow in, in Yuma. I think what they found and, and what the purpose, the original idea was to grow the items, ship them up to the states and process them here in in um, in the states. Uh, eventually, a few different processors started making their own processing facilities down there. And they thought, okay, we're gonna grow them, process them here and ship them up as finished goods to the state, to the states. At the end, when everything got done, they found that there was a market in Mexico itself. So a lot of the processing facilities in central Mexico, where they started out to be, hey, you know what, we're gonna process everything and send everything to these states. Well, now they found they found their own market in Mexico as well. And a lot of the processors are just selling to Mexican chain stores uh, down there. At the same time, um, you, as you see an increase in in, uh, in income levels in, in Mexico, you start to see where uh, typically they had bought uh, products in bulk like lettuce and, and onions and, and uh, tomatoes. And then, but now if the opportunity is there to buy processed and bag lettuce, uh, like the, like we do here, a lot of the, a lot of the sales here in the United States are that way. Then they'll go and they'll they'll buy them that way as well. So I I think what came out as one idea ended up being a, a whole nother business opportunity for lots of the American processors that went down to Mexico uh, 15 18 years ago. Interesting. Anybody else want to weigh in? We down in Mexico, we've had two very large processors come in in the last five years. And it has, as John was uh, talking, uh, provided product ready to go, ready to be consumed uh, by the consumer. And I think it's been a big boon to, to the area, both uh, for the need of product and but also for the, on the labor and quality of life uh, in Mexico. So no, we're seeing the same thing down here. And I, th I, th I think we're being more competitive. <clears throat> I have a large bean grower uh, for, for green beans in Mexico. And just recently, the market went very high, anywhere between $28 and $30 a box. And at the same time, the market was at five to 600 pesos uh, a box for the same product in Mexico itself. So uh, there are many, many times when the grower will say, well, wait a minute. Uh, today, you know, is it, is it better to send my products to the state or is it better to send my products to the national market, which is, I, I think it keeps a, a, a very good level, uh, at least for its, its level for us on the marketing end, uh, that there is a very good robust national markets uh, and opportunities with the national chain stores and national food service companies as there are for um, the exportable. Uh, product. So I think that uh, the, the stronger economy that we have in Mexico, the better opportunities there are for, for farmers that grow on both ends. Great. Let's switch gears. We had a couple of questions I'm going to combine to um, asking how can young people get started in farming? And, and tied to that is how can new farmers get involved with the farming community and, and actually create policies? Uh, Paul, I'll jump in again. Uh, I appreciate the question. Um, the average age of a farmer in uh, in Arizona is just upwards of 55 years old, and uh, and the average age of a farm worker uh, in uh, in Yuma County um, over a 20 year run increased by over 10 years. So uh, we're not only seeing agriculture. Uh, 
operators uh, aging. We're also seeing um, uh, we're also seeing the workforce age, and uh, and that's I know more people are working later in life, but uh, but our agricultural work is not always easy. For um, um, you know, the sun is we hope the same every day and uh, beats down on you, and again, <laughs> it can get a little challenging to work, as you know, Paul, for a long, long. Uh, time in agriculture, uh, regardless of what type of job you do. Uh, so I appreciate that that question. I think that there is a huge opportunity, and um, uh, I'll tell everybody what my father told me. Um, I'm sure most of these panelists would probably agree um, with what he said. My dad, when I was a young young teenager and a young man, he he. Re reiterated to me over and over again that there's no replacement for experience in agriculture. Um, it's just one of those fields where um, it's tough to teach and, uh, and it's one of those things that you have to have a lot of experience. So um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not denigrating education. I think it's imperative that folks uh, get lots of education because I think a lot of the solutions to problems that we face today and a lot of the opportunities lie in uh, developing new technology uh, and exploiting that new technology to improve the way we do things and the profitability of what we do. Uh, thus, we're able to stay in business. Uh, agriculture has historically very poor margins, but huge opportunity. Um, people need to eat, and, uh, and these crops are not gonna be produced without people growing them and without people handling them and, and helping produce them. So uh, I think it's a huge thing. And then I couldn't agree more with the way the question was asked. Uh, folks should have an, an opportunity to weigh in on public policy, those that uh, produce and, and grow and harvest our agricultural crops. I think uh, regardless what side of the border they're on, I think we're long past agriculture, uh, uh, finding a stronger voice and being able to uh, impact public policy for the betterment of everybody. After all, our interest is in producing an affordable and abundant food supply for North America. And, uh, and I think too many people are focused on too many other things that are setting public policy. And, and John's, John's first vice president of Arizona Farm Bureau. And that's, you know, that's, it's okay to plug that. That's one of the ways that people, producers get involved and, and get to know the farm community and, and have a say on policies so, and other organizations like that, which Jaime has also been involved with. Well, I, I also wanted to add that, you know, I think that as we go forward in, in our industry and, and talking to kids, I, I don't think that they may have a misconception of where farming is going. I think farming is going a lot more. So the jobs that people think, well, do I really have to be up at six o'clock in the morning and work till 10 o'clock at night? And yeah, well, you know, there are some jobs that technology is not gonna replace people at all. But I do see more electric vehicles and electric tractors and, and there, there are more drone operators now for tractors and for, um, for, for there's more technology in water um, as well. So, and as in Mexico, as we see our protected agricultural business uh, has exploded, um, we do see a need for a more specialized type of worker that actually um, is very much accustomed to working in that environment, whether it's a shade house or, or a plastic house, green, greenhouse or, or, a, or a glass house. Um, so I think that, you know, when and since our, our, our businesses are merging together, I would say, and they have been for over a century, uh, both in domestic product and, and Mexican product, uh, you're going to start to see more and more uh, need for people in the ag industry, whether it's accountants that under, understand our cross-border businesses. Um, I'm sure Randy knows a lot about that. He's got and, and, and attorneys who know more about our cross-border businesses as, as our contracts get more uh, complex, whether it's our labor contracts or our water contracts, or even with our contracts with our customers. I think there's so many opportunities for young people nowadays that are not just, you know, you're going to be out there for 15, 16, 18 hours a day in the hot sun. And it's ag is not all is not like that all the time. And, and in the future, I think we're going to see 
some tremendous opportunities for young people in the, that are related to the uh, ag industry. I don't know if you all agree. Without a doubt, um, I would encourage anyone who's interested in, in being in ag, uh, one, to find a quality program like the U of A uh, has. I would also encourage anyone who's even thinking about it to do an internship or two, just to see, is it for me? You know, the, the get past the misconceptions and what you're, when you're talking about the technology and you're talking about what we do, it is in the, in the 30 some odd years I've been in this business, it's already evolved so much. And then when I look at where it's going, I watched the other day, you talk about drones. Down in Mexico, we, we don't have aerial spraying. And so we have to run spray rigs. And if the field's wet, we can't get in. The other day I sat and watched these, these three drones come in and do a whole field and they were done in 30 minutes. It was amazing. Never thought I'd see it in my lifetime. And for somebody who is uh, interested in that type of thing, what a rewarding uh, occupation to get into. So no, anyone who asks me and, and says, I think I wanna be in farming or I think I wanna do ag, I tell them to get out and, and experience different aspects of it and see, you might think, hey, I wanna be a grower, maybe, Maybe, maybe you like doing on the packaging side, but try to be well-rounded. Um, my son's in agriculture. He, he would has experience in a lot of different aspects of this business before he made a decision about what he wanted to be part of. And I encouraged it because I wanted him to be well-versed and have a very good um, overview of what, what this industry was. Thank you very much. Perfect. Let's shift to a couple of water questions. Um, Wade, I'm gonna throw a couple your way. Uh, one question was whether the, um, the treaty between Mexico and the United States, uh, does it have an expiration date and, and do you anticipate modifications or new minutes to it um, that would change the amount of water going to Mexico? Sure, let me give you a long answer since I'm an attorney. Uh, in the United States, the use of Colorado River water is subject to the Bureau of Reclamation and the Secretary of Interior. On the lower Colorado River, the Secretary of Interior is actually the water master and controls that water. However, that control ends at the border with Mexico. And so reclamation and interior do not control the treaty. That's controlled by the State Department. And I think it would be fair to say over the years, as we've seen uh, work with Mexico, that the State Department sometimes seems to favor Mexico with regards to the water treaty. On the other hand, interior, favors more the U.S. uses. And so there's a little bit of conflict there. Do I foresee a minute, which would be a change in the treaty that would um, allow for more uh, conservation, uh, perhaps even cuts in Mexico's entitlement? Yeah, I do. Because there's going to have to be something worked out where uh, the shortage as it deepens, uh, as it gets worse, uh, that we're going to have to all give up some water to keep the system running. At some point, it doesn't matter how good your rights are if there's no water in the river. As far as the expiration of the treaty, no, it's not going to expire. So it's not set to expire. There you go, Paul. Thank you. That wasn't too long. And, and I know attorneys charge by the hour, so you had me nervous. <laughs> um, well, while, we, while we've got to you and talking about water, Wade, um, there was also a question about aging infrastructure and, and delivery inefficiencies. And I, I know, um, I don't know if it's impactful in that area, but, but certainly we've had a large infrastructure package go through Congress. Um, so I just wonder if you have any thoughts on, on uh, working to improve delivery inefficiencies. 
in our area, as correctly noted, some of our projects uh, have been in place for well over 100 years. Uh, we've been taking water out of the river and using conveyance and delivery systems to get it to different parts of agriculture. And it is aged by definition. Um, but then along those lines, with regards to the Colorado River, uh, we are in a situation where we can apply water and if it is not consumed by the crop, then it returns to the river one way or the other, either underflow or subflow or directly through a drain, it's returned to the river and is available for use downstream. Those return flows all get credited, whether it is a loss of water uh, from the time it's turned out of the river until it hits the field through seepage or something else, those return flows are generally credited. So it's not a complete loss of water because of the inefficiency. Friends of mine have uh, argued with me in the past that if you lined all the canals, all the laterals and all the irrigation ditches, you would save water. Um, that is a debate that can go on. Uh, reclamation does calculate very well the return flows and gives credit for all the water that returns to the river. And so in that respect, some districts, such as the reservation division, some districts look at that and say, okay, would it make a difference at all if we did that? Some say yes. And so there's a lot of lining that goes on for large canals, laterals, and ditches. Other uh, districts say, you know, it's going right back to the river that I can throw a rock at from where I'm standing. And therefore, it doesn't make sense to spend millions of dollars to line 30, 40, 50 miles of canals when it's not going to save water in reality. One further bit of infrastructure issue has to do with the Imperial Dam. The Imperial Dam is not a... Um, regulating reservoir dam. It does not contain water for storage. What it does is it uh, uh, delivers water. So through Imperial Dam, there's five to six million acre feet that are delivered every year out of the Colorado River. All of Mexico's deliveries of Colorado River water come through Imperial Dam. Well, it is aging and it is aged. The electrical up Electricity, electrical systems had to be upgraded. The dam itself has to have worked on it. All of that cost is borne primarily by those irrigation districts, both on the California side and the Arizona side that use the dam for diverting their water. Uh, and that cost has been tremendous, but they have borne it so that we can have efficient use of or efficient delivery and diversion of water. Uh, uh, other than the infrastructure on, 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 on in water, I, I did want to reiterate there that in Arizona, we're very fortunate that we have just had um, a, a, an appropriation of, well, 200 and some odd million dollars for the phase two of the San Luis port of entry and another close to $400 million for the Douglas port of entry. Um, to be modernized, and and along with the deca with the Mariposa Port of Entry that was modernized about uh, eight years ago, I, I think that that uh, puts us in a position here uh, uh, for for tremendous gro cross border growth, um, and and I, I I believe we've always been big supporters uh, of of ports of entry and and their efficiencies, um, but as whether it's uh, J.B. Smith that, that grows or whether it's Chamberlain or whoever grows on whatever side of the border, it's extremely important to have uh, modern and efficient ports of entry just as it is to have modern and efficient uh, uh, ways to carry our water across border. Um, you know, uh, we always talk about the importation of Mexican fruits and vegetables, and we rarely talk about the the importation of American fruits and vegetables in Mexico. Um, Mexico has become uh, one of the largest um, uh, buyers of, of American fruits and vegetables in the world. Uh, they take a great portion of 
um, off grades uh, from your stone fruits. They take a great portion of the off grades uh, of, um, uh, of uh, tomatoes as well during the summer seasons. Uh, I, so I think that there's, you know, we, we always look at, yeah, we're importing so many, so many, so much Mexican product into the United States and Canada, but we're also exporting a tremendous amount of domestic fruit. And I, I think every farmer in the United States can tell you whether they're in the, in, in the fruits and vegetables business or whether it's cattle and, and hogs or, or whatever it may be, Mexico is an extremely important market for, for domestic farmers in the United States. Um, we, we are seeing, you know, John, you were talking about cattle just recently. Well, you know, the trend is now in, in, in Arizona is sending cattle to be slaughtered in Hermosillo, you know, three and a half hours away from Nogales. And, and it comes back packaged and ready to go to Walmart. Uh, so so it, it's, a, it's a kind of a maquiladora business there. So it, it gets fattened up at a certain weight. It goes down to Mexico, gets fattened up, gets slaughtered and comes back as a packaged as a, as a value added product. So, and that's happening every single day. Um, so I think that that relationship is very, very important and we all have to support those infrastructure uh, improvements um, for the betterment of the state of Arizona and for our country as well. That's a great point. And I, I don't know the exact number, but, but certainly agriculture as, as an American industry um, exports something like almost half of what we make, is that right? Um, what we produce. And, and so, you know, we really do feed the world and, th and that agriculture is a lot of the reason that our trade imbalance is, you know, not worse. Um, so really, really well, good points. Well, you look, you look at our trade imbalances for every $1 that China sends, set, buys a product to, to, uh, of, the, of American products, they buy back one cent uh, of American products to China. And in turn, for every dollar that a Mexican sells to the Mexican sell to the United States, they buy it back about 40 to 45 cents of American products. That's a great trading partner. And, and, and when we throw Canada into the mix, Paul, it is absolutely imperative that we protect uh, this trading block uh, of Canada, the United States and Mexico. Uh, and, and we, we didn't become the greatest trading block in, in the world overnight. Uh, but I, I'll tell you what, we, we better start paying better attention to each other in, in order to maintain that. I hope that makes sense. No, it does. And there's, there's events happening in the world right now that, uh, that I think are pointing to more of that, of, of producing locally. So um, I'm going to grab the last water question myself the it was asked about um, Israeli irrigation efficiencies and some of those technologies I think John mentioned or, or Wade somebody mentioned the end drip uh, technology which is a, a drip irrigation that, that that doesn't require pressurization and filtering um, and, and will these will these types of technologies work uh, in our arid lands and and I guess I would say, you know, there's no one answer to anything and, and ag agriculture's water story is so different in different parts of the state, depending whether you're, you know, getting it directly from the Colorado River or from the Central Arizona Project or from groundwater or from, um, you know, surface water of Arizona rivers. Um, they all have different issues. But just as an example, typically people's perception is, well, the way to save water is to use drip. Um, our biggest project at, at, at my center of excellence has been looking at crop water use and, and the impacts of soil salinity. And when you irrigate a crop, you have to provide both water for what the crop needs to grow, but also um, leaching the salts out. It's been talked about the, the salts in the Colorado River and, uh, and those have to be leached out of the root zone, especially for tender crops like lettuce and leafy greens. And so that's, those two put together are what you need to irrigate. And it turns out when we measure crop water use and, and the, the irrigation that's applied, most of the leafy green crops and, and many of the rotation crops, um, the way that they're done, at least in the Yuma area, um, they're too efficient. And I like to use that word because it gets people's attention. Well, what do you mean too efficient? You always want to be more efficient. Um, but if you're not 
providing enough water to do, do the leaching of the salts that you need, your ground is gonna become unsustainable for producing um, crops. And so eventually you have to leach that somehow. Um, and that's the point that the farmers are at. And like I say, at least in the Yuma area, um, for a lot of the crops, they are not watering enough because they're so efficient that at some other point in the year, either through a rotation crop or through a, a separate watering, they have to leach those salts out. So there's really not the opportunity to put some technology like drip in and save water because we're already not irrigating enough on these crops. And so it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but, but just keep in mind, it's not always, there's not always the ability to just put less water on and be more efficient. Um, so switching gears from water before we, before we run out of time, um, John, there was a question, you, you mentioned it would be a whole nother webinar, but there was a question about the H2A program and, and what kind of opportunities and challenges it has. You've mentioned, um, you, you've mentioned some of the, the good parts of it. And, and the question was, what are some of the challenges? I appreciate that question. I saw that in the queue. Um, uh, the, the biggest challenge is really uh, implementation of the law. The spirit of the law was provide agriculture with a uh, guest worker program that met their needs, uh, that did not um, that did not denigrate the domestic labor market, didn't lower wages, uh, didn't pull workers away, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, as governments frequently do, they found a way to make that as difficult as possible um, to uh, have a uh, to have a program where you have to work with five different federal agencies, and you have to um, uh, provide housing that's inspected by one of those agencies. Uh, to to have a program that, uh, by the letter of the law, is prescribed to um, you're only able to resubscribe some a worker to the program just a couple of years, uh, and then lose the opportunity to continue to use that worker after a few years, it's just, none of it makes sense. Uh, it was designed to have folks not uh, feel attached here. And the reality is we need, the program itself has major challenges. So those are just three of them. And, uh, but it's the only program we have right now. So uh, everybody says, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need that program until we actually have a good working guest worker program. And so I think that's the best synopsis I can give of it with pointing out those three of the biggest shortcomings. Great. Um, John, one more for you. It was uh, asked, you mentioned the aging workforce and that's probably not just in agriculture. Um, do you see any correlation to aging workforce and the cost of housing? Just, you know, from the availability of framers and construction workers. Yeah, we're, uh, while everybody that sets public policy in our country uh, at the federal level debates some of the strangest things, um, yeah, we have some real crises uh, that if we had great leadership would be talking about, um, it wouldn't be just throwing band-aids on, you know, aging infrastructure of roads and waterways uh, when people scream loud about it, it wouldn't be we be looking at some of these long-term problems. We see that one of our biggest competitors uh, on the world stage, China, uh, shot itself in the foot decades ago uh, with their one child policy and, and limiting their uh, families, obviously, in the first place. And then, um, and then uh, their entire economy and their entire future over the long haul. Uh, I think the US uh, is much better placed than that. Uh, but we certainly have shortcomings. Uh, the aging workforce, um, yeah, I don't think people continue to work necessarily uh, because they want to, but sometimes it's because they have to. So inflation has been a real deal long before the government and the media started talking about it being a big deal. That's a huge deal. Cost of affordable housing in our country, um, it's been in crisis for over 20 years. So um, yeah, we, we, again, we could do a whole seminar on that, but I completely agree. Uh, with the question asked. Uh, any other comments on that? Um, if not, we'll totally change gears. And uh, th this actually goes kind of, this does go back to the value added part we talked about. And um, 
uh, somebody mentioned that we've had an explosion really in, in popularity of culinary arts and celebrity chefs and uh, farm to table ideas and uh, organics and sustainable food production. Um, so the question was, you know, what kind of, of opportunities do you see for agriculture to collaborate with those trends and, and those people and those programs to uh, enhance, you know, the ability to, to differentiate the product and, and pull more value out of it? I, well, I'll, I'll jump in, Paul, and say, I think we need to have some sideboards on that. Um, sustainability and some of these topics uh, take on a life of their own and to some degree can become marketing. Um, I think those things arise when those of us in agriculture and those of us in agricultural marketing haven't done a good job about talking about just how incredibly sustainable uh, and how uh, efficient we have become over the last uh, several decades. And um, the ability to produce the crops and the quantities and on the small amount of land with the small amount of water that we do these days um, and small amount of pesticides is just not talked about. And so we, uh, we've shot ourselves in the foot and missed the opportunity. So um, I think, unfortunately, when it's talked about frequently in the, in the press, um, it's a misnomer. And when it's used from a marketing standpoint, it may not be all that accurate because production agriculture, just simply to stay in business, has become so efficient. But I'm sure some other folks on the panel can, can certainly uh, contribute more to that. Go ahead, Jaime. No, I, I, I think that, like I said, these are all opportunities for us to market food in general and fresh produce as well. Um, uh, like I said, I've never seen more children uh, more inquisitive about, uh, about food and where food comes from um, and experimenting with different types of food. And I think, uh, I think the country is, is, is changing and, and, and our demographics are changing. And with that, our, our, our food preferences change as well. And uh, I, I, I've never seen so many products with, with mangoes in them. I've never seen uh, avocados used in the way they're being used right now. I've never seen so many Americans and Canadians embracing different types of chilies um, in, in their foods, whether it's in their soups or uh, wherever they're at. I, I, I think it's, it, it's amazing um, what a great opportunity we have to promote farming and to promote uh, food marketing in general. Um, John, I, I, I agree with you that I, I think that sometimes, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of it is marketing on, on whether it's the retailers or to, to press up uh, pricing uh, to the consumers. And, and that doesn't necessarily come down to the farmers um, at, at all. And uh, there, there are some players out there that take great advantages of, of, of certain situations that don't really merit uh, uh, the, 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 the hype. You know, during COVID, I can tell you one bit, I can tell you farming didn't stop, okay? So when Americans uh, were going into the stores and didn't see anything on the shelves, that wasn't John's fault, that wasn't Randy's fault, and it certainly wasn't Wade's fault. And it wasn't Hyman's fault either. We were importing, we were growing domestic product and, and, imp, and importing uh, products from Mexico every single day. In fact, we lost money. Uh, the inability for the retailers to actually take on uh, that much product when our restaurants uh, were closing uh, during COVID was astronomical. We, we were finding that food service companies were, were our competitors selling to retailers um, because they needed to sell the products that they had on hand, whether it was cheese or tomatoes or bell peppers or whatever it was. You know, you had all these food service companies with all these millions of dollars worth of food and they were trying to sell to retailers in their areas. And the retailers were telling us, well, we've got to cancel your orders because we've got to help out these food service companies that have these millions of dollars worth of food that's going to spoil. And whatever we can do, we're going to, we're going to put it through this retail channel. Well, they didn't have the labor, they didn't have the space, 
Um, and it was a very, very difficult time. But I, I try to tell people left and right that during COVID, you know, we didn't run out of food at all. In fact, we had plenty of food and we ended up disking product in Georgia, we dis product in Florida, we just product in Mexico, and probably in Yuma as well, Randy. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure, but I, I, we lost money during that time um, because we couldn't get it to the consumer through the channels that we were accustomed to. Randy, totally, you concur, totally concur with with your analysis of what happened during COVID. Uh, Nobody in the agriculture industry uh, stopped working. We uh, did everything we can, even working in some of our packing 24 hours because we had to go to half shifts. But we did, did disc a lot of acres due to uh, either this lack of, lack of market. And I think the point made by Jaime that a lot of other sources we're going into the market is is well well taken and, and an outstanding point and one thing that uh people may not realize and i can only speak for the yuma area but about half the production here goes to food service uh which, which is the schools and the airplanes and the convention centers and um and the other half goes to retail so when that sector completely shut down which is what jaime was referencing there was just not the channel to to redirect that to different packaging and, and, and different uh, uh, customers. So yeah, that, that was a huge disruption. And, and John and Randy, you know, t tell everybody on the group here, what happened to our contracts? What happened to our food service contracts with, um, with, uh, with, 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 with uh, fast food companies? What happened to our contracts with, uh, with uh, airlines? What happened to our contracts with, uh, uh, the um, uh, the, the um, cruise ship industries. What happened to our contracts with our hotels industries, uh, our, our casino contracts? They cut them off, one hundred percent. And what are, what are we going to do? Are we going to sue those customers? Nine out, nine out of ten of us didn't sue those customers because there wasn't anything we can do. There was we were in the middle of a pandemic, and as a farmer, it's very difficult to see that you're having to disc product because of, because of this. And then you're expected to come back the next year and plant the same amount with very little confidence and not really knowing as far as what is around the corner for, for you as a farmer. So everyone on this call, I, I, I have, we have to really think about how we think about farming and and the respect that we have for, for those people who are putting foods on our tables. Go ahead, Randy. Well, I, I think I appreciate that. And, you know, we're, I, I don't want to sidetrack too much here, but we're referencing the, the pandemic is a very tough time in agriculture. And yes, that was tough for the fact that we were, disking product that we had grown. And as, as, as was stated, you know, people were saying basically act of God because of the pandemic, they couldn't take the product. Now we're being faced yet another year with another, uh, I want to say, I don't want to say crisis, but hard times due to things far outside our, our influence where supply chain, the war, we're seeing stresses on our systems that we've never seen in my lifetime and we're trying to work through them now um as we did before will we survive yes sir we will but we are having to make adjustments yet again and uh hopefully one of these years we'll uh be able to go through without having to work with more adversity than what we normally do randy i think it's fair to say crisis <laughs> it's a good I'll, I, I'll, I'll tell you because the majority of our supply chain issues and and the majority of our of our of our increases in our in our fertilizers and 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 the things that we use to to farm you know we're already we were already planting so yes. i tell people all the time you know farming is not just 
what happens today. Today, we're planning three years out, five years out. Today, we are planning our contracts for 2023 already. Uh, we are trying to figure out what is going to be the ac adequate supply that we're going to need. Um, are we going to get back to a little bit to normal or are all these inflationary um, uh, pressures going to limit what we're going to be farming here in the future? So Randy, you are very right. We are around the corner from a crisis because for next season, we, we really don't know exactly how much is going to be around. It depends on how much we can afford. I'm not sure even if it's that. I've talked to some very intelligent, very smart, well-versed people in the world of uh, fertilizers, especially about nitrogen and, and ammonia. And they're not too enthusiastic about the future on that going forward. It, it's very, they're saying, we might not have any at all, no matter what you can pay. And so anyone who knows what we do for a living will understand the necessity of those two substances. And yeah, it could definitely impact uh, the productivity and what crops we are able to, to grow. So yes, uh, I would agree with it. Maybe crisis is a pretty good word. Uh, <laughs> Fast, fascinating so discussion. And, and everybody's crystal balls broke with the pandemic. And I, I know that's tough because you have to, when you decide what to plant, you're deciding for what the market's going to be three months from now, and that that's hard. We have about three minutes left. I wanted to shift to one other topic that's kind of tangential to what we were talking about, but organics. Organics are are popular, growing in popularity, um, and people go to the store and you know they may or may not buy them because they may be more expensive, but um, but they feel good buying them. You guys all have different perspectives um, on the what it takes to produce organics, what, what the marketing is of organics. But I'm just curious if you could weigh in a little bit because people probably have no perception of what does it even mean to grow organic and, and how do you decide how much to grow? What's the market for it? What are the challenges in doing it? Maybe starting with Randy. Uh, uh, Paul, I'd just say, go, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, John, you start. I, I'd just jump in and say that, you know, it's just a different way of growing. Uh, different different standards and different mechanisms. Every everything we're growing, whether we grow it conventionally or organically, still relying on all the same processes. Uh, really, just um, it's the type of pesticides and the type of fertilizers that you're using, uh, for the most part. And uh, and I'll turn it over to Randy to answer further. Well, I mean, John's correct, and and on the organics, you know, I read an article today that. Uh, even with the higher prices, the, the organic consumer is still um, purchasing. They haven't seen a drop off uh, like they were thinking was going to be coming. Um, organics, we have not seen some of the increases on our, our inputs on organics because it's not uh, petroleum based. And so when we were looking at our budgets and which I was doing prior to this, this call today, um, organics have not had an increase percentage wise as much as conventional. The conventional as, as we're saying here today is an unknown. And we're right now already starting to make our budgets for this next winter season. And there's three or four categories that we're really, really vague on because we're not sure where things are gonna go. Uh, organics are still strong, they're a known entity. Uh, the clientele, if you're an organic person, you're an organic person. And I still think organics are remain strong and maybe, quite honestly, with uh, conventional probably going up in price, you might see more people shift to organic if, if, if the pricing gets closer. So I think there's a lot of, lot of opportunity there. Well, thank you. And I, Jaime, I know you probably have something to, to weigh into. If you could do it real quick just, and then I know Evelyn just quick, Just quickly, I'll, I'll tell you that when we started to see organics on the market and organic farming uh, grow a little bit, my father used to say, Jaime, it's a fad. Don't worry about it because we, we import all, all conventional products and, and it's a fad. Well, let me tell you something. It's not a fad anymore. You are seeing an increase in size uh, of the footprint of organics in every single market, whether it's a club store 
or whether it's a, a, a conventional uh, chain store, uh, you went from seeing uh, or get, uh, two or three different items. Now you see 25 different organic items or 30 different items. And you you started to see them in 12 by 12 inches uh, of availability. And now you start to see them with 12 foot, 14 foot long tables in the center aisle, in the center aisle and some at, at, the, at, the, at the caps. Um, so organics is here to stay and it's a, it's a growing sector of our industry. Um, but unfortunately, I, I, I don't think it was really started out to be so expensive as it is to the consumer nowadays. Uh, I think a lot of people started growing organics because they started thinking about what kind of uh, pesticides and insecticides were being sprayed on their, on their uh, produce. And um, they felt that this was a better a, a better option for them. But I, I don't think um, the, the original intent was to make organics so much more expensive than, con than con conventional products at the retail level. And um, you're seeing nowadays uh, that a lot of the organic sales are very similar to, uh, or at least on the FOB side, uh, right, at, right, at the, uh, right at the source, they're, they're starting to be very similar to pricing of, of conventional products. It's at the retail side to the consumer where you see that astronomical difference where you may see zucchini at $1.29 a pound and you see organic zucchini at $3.29 a pound. Um, that is, that is uh, I think for a marketer like myself, and a representative of, of farmers, I think that's that's really difficult. I mean, I, I want to get into farming. I want to get into farming organic product, but my farmers say they get less product per hectare if they're not able to protect from certain viruses and diseases that we that we can protect with with some of the um, insecticides that we have available to us in conventional. So I think that that's something to that uh, is, is really brings up a lot of thoughtful debate, Paul, uh, on, yeah. uh, on organics versus conventional. It does. Thank you all for your input. We're, we're past time. I want to thank you all. Right. This has been a great panel. I, I really appreciate you agreeing to do this and, and for your insights. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Evelyn. Yes, and, and my goodness, we still really could go on for at least another couple of hours, but not today, but we hopefully we can get you all back. So Paul, Randy, Jaime, Wade, John, thank you so much for your participation today. Um, to our participants, thank you for, for you, yeah, you, you have witnessed and been part of a very rich, robust, uh, enlightening conversation. And uh, we hope that all of you will join us at some future events with Arizona Town Hall regarding our uh, Arizona Sonoran uh, 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 fellowship we have together. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this session has been recorded because there was a lot of great information and you may want to go back and listen to some of that. Um, please check our website, aztownhall.org. And with that, thank you all once again, panelists and Paul so much and uh, best wishes to you. It's, uh, you've got, a, you've got a, a lot going on and we appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all.